This um, semester's uh, history class is, like all my other classes, the uh, primary focus is, of course, painting. Um, some of you may not have realized that. Um, there's a reason you see a lot of paintings in my class. They're intended for those of you who are aspiring painters, students of painting, connoisseurs of painting. And um, this time it'll be painting in Venice, would be another way of calling it, or the Venetian Renaissance, as I've also called it. Um, and I will tell the story um, through painting. However, sometimes I have to use other things like buildings, maps, drawings, and uh, today's class and next week's class, uh, a little bit of next week's class, is an introduction to Venice in European history. Through paintings, through some aerial photographs, through some maps. So, Venice has a very specific contribution to the history of painting. Uh, those of you who've taken art history classes will have been introduced to this. You will have heard some of the primary figures um, of Venice's uh, offerings to the world of painting. Of course, uh, the three big T's, Titian, Tiepolo, Tintoretto, um, or a couple of others. So, let's begin. Is that uh, elucidating enough? Okay. Now, um, yeah, just uh, to reiterate the point, I use paintings from all different periods. Um, because it's Venice, I'm going to try to use as many Venetian paintings as I can to tell the history of the story of Venice, um, or paintings that have been influenced by Venetian paintings as well. So, Caspar uh, van Vittel um, was not a Venetian painter. Um, he was from Holland. He moved to Italy. In moving to Italy, he became Van Vitelli, and um, he was the father of one of the last great uh, Baroque architects of 18th century Italy, also known as Van Vitelli, who principally uh, was an architect in Naples and was the architect of that huge uh, palace, Caserta, outside of Naples. So, But Van Vitelli is important because he began, he's one of the key figures to begin painting cities, and um, he directly influenced um, the two great Venetian city painters, Canaletto and his nephew, Bellotto, with whom we will conclude our 10-week series. Okay. So, Venice is known to us in many ways because, um, apart from the painters, it's an exotic city. Um, why is it exotic? It's exotic because it exists between several worlds. There's a lot of Gothic there. There's a fair bit of Byzantine. There's some high Renaissance. And um, even the Renaissance and the Baroque has a very Venetian flavor. So um, when I begin the history of Venice in painting, I'll go back to its... Um, its beginnings, and so this represents um, the beginnings. Uh, Venice definitely participated in what's called the International Gothic, and this is one of the great works of uh, a Venetian painter of the International Gothic. Um, the High Renaissance clearly is represented by Titian, and this is one of his um, hugely influential paintings. Um, and yet strangely not very characteristic of Titian, and we'll look at it and talk about it. And uh, finally, um, the, oh, oh, right, I'm, I'm not moving. Oh yeah, Titian. Right, I'm looking at my notes here. Um, anyways, yes, um, Titian. Uh, strangely uncharacteristic um, because of the architectural frame. Um, 
but it will hugely influence many paintings, including his 18th century heirs, such as Tiepolo. But the origins of Venice go way back. They actually go back to ancient Rome and its surviving polity in the East, Byzantium. And this is an icon from Byzantium. Um, it's called the Nicopea. And um, it is one of the trophies of uh, an expedition to Byzantium that Venice participated in. And um, of course, the most character characteristic monument and the most easily recognizable monuments of Venice are the Doge's Palace, which is peaking to the right, and of course, St. Mark's. Now, if you look at this little corner in St. Mark's, it tells an important story, because in that little corner are four emperors, and um, a part of the statue is missing, it, that fra part, a big part, chunk of that fragment turned up, not in Venice, but in today's Istanbul, in the former Constantinople. And that's a part of the story that we will um, turn to halfway through our, our bigger trajectory. So where is Venice? Maps are indispensable. It's in the upper portion of the Adriatic, as you can see. It's in a lagoon, in fact, it's very much the city of the lagoon. So positioning it geographically, it's right there. It's in, a, it's in the largest valley in um, Italy, the Po Valley. There's the great river Po. Um, the major city of the Po Valley, of course, is Milan, but also secondarily Turin, more famously Mantua, but it's not in the delta. It's actually north of the delta in a tidal marshy lagoon. Um, there's a photograph of the delta from space. As you can see, the, the Alps are slowly being deposited um, in the northern Adriatic. And it's in the backwash of all of that. There's the lagoon, and the city of Venice is right here. Um, another thing you'll notice is I show maps regularly, just to give you an idea of where. Um, I've learned through friends of mine who deal with Canadian high schools and high school students that uh, apparently geography is one of the most challenging classes now in Canadian high schools. I, for me, it was one of the easiest classes, but I don't know why. There's a mystery there. Okay, so here is a, a map of uh, the lagoon of Venice and the high water and the navigable water as it stood in 1900. Um, Venice in 1900 was actually in pretty good shape. Um, unfortunately, during World War I, it was bombed by the Austrians that were um, not that far from Venice by their artillery. But more disastrously, after World War II, a large industrial port was established, um, an oil refinery, um, just north of, north um, west of Venice. And um, to supply the refineries with water, they dug artesian wells. The artesian wells went deep into the aquifer. And it turns out that um, the aquifer, given that it is um, particular um, delta deposits of uh, clays and sand, is what supported the ground. So the fact that Venice is flooding today has a lot to do with these refineries pulling water out of the ground and lowering the uh, level of the ground to below sea level. So a disaster that didn't have to happen, but it did. So for a part of the year, uh, big portions of Venice are under a meter or two of water, which means all the ground stories have to be vacated. And um, because um, the uh, 
the effluent goes directly into the canals. It means the whole city is one vast sewer up to the second floor for large stretches of the air, which is, of course, quite disastrous. Here's a 16th century aerial, imagined aerial view of um, Venice, one of the first attempts to see the Venice as a whole. Okay, so my title is From Refuge to Empire. Again, we mostly know Venice from the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, which you could very much call the long golden afternoon and early twilight of Venice, which, where uh, the Venetians produced some of their most extraordinary and characteristic works of art. Um, but Venice was also politically and economically a major player in the Mediterranean. And for quite a few centuries, it was also an imperial city. So we'll see how it emerged to become the imperial city. It was basically into the 16th and 17th century. And um, it's a city on the water. So this is a great painting by um, Tiepolo entitled Neptune Offers the Wealth of the Sea to Venice. The wealth of the sea, of course, is trade. So above and beyond everything, a maritime city. You can see the iconography here. Here's the lion representing St. Mark. Here's Poseidon Neptune, right? And here's the personification of Venice. This is a large painting that resides in the Doge's Palace. And um, the Doge's Palace uh, is called the Doge's Palace because the representative iconic figure of Venice, who is a quasi-monarch, the Doge ruled from this building. This is a painting by Canaletto showing not just the Doge's Palace, St. Mark's, the library, the Campanile, but also the Doge's ceremonial barge, which we'll zero in on, um, where the ritual of the renewal of the marriage between Venice and the sea was played out when the Doge's palace, floating palace rather, the barge went out into the Adriatic and they drop the ring into the Adriatic. Now, here's a model. The Doge's great boat was burned at the end of Venetian history by the French revolutionary Jacobin troops in the early 19th century. And there is a project to reconstruct it, um, to reconstruct it using the original techniques, i.e not fake wood, but actual wooden timbers that are formed. And um, ultimately, the whole thing was gilded. So it's going to be spectacular. It also had a spectacular flag as well. We just now need to have a doge and have Venice independent once again. Um, here's a lovely um, reconstruction from the early 19th century of what it uh, looked like. It was a galley, of course. It wasn't really meant to do much more than just row out into the Adriatic and then come back. So, Venice began as a Roman city. It has a long trajectory that goes back to the 5th and 6th centuries. It also has a mythological history. So, we're going to look at both. Um, I've shown this painting before. I love this painting. Um, for me, this painting, it's a Russian painting called The Flying Carpet, um, or Ivan Tsarevich by Viktor Vas Vasnestov, um, a uh, late 19th, early 20th century Russian painter. It's uh, an illustration of a Russian folk tale. We don't really need to know too much about the folk tale. It's what's told in the painting. So a lot of what we do, given the compression of time, um, is fly over our subject, um, hopefully being guided by an inner light that allows us to zero in on 
key aspects of our subject and um, and guided by a little bit of wisdom. See the owls of Minerva guiding our journey as well. But it can be a little foggy at times. Okay, so. Venice and empire. So one of the themes is the city, and Venice was a city and urban polity, in fact, a kind of republic, and the other theme is empire. Not only was Venice an empire, but Venice collided with, traded with, and fought with empires. And of course, the great Western empire here was represented by this uh, magnificent uh, portrait of Titians of the last great Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, who ruled a big part of the world. Um, as the Holy Roman Emperor, he ruled uh, the provinces of the Roman Empire. He also ruled most of Italy, Spain, and all the colonies of Spain. So, um, it wasn't necessarily good for Spain becoming an empire. Um, they had too much gold and they relied on their gold rather than building up a vital middle class. And so, um, well, it's what happens when you just rely on cash rather than on the productivity of your population. Um, we're the members of another empire who's making the same mistake, as some of you know. Um, anyhow, in Italy, uh, the Spanish ruled southern Italy, Sicily, Sardinia, and at times parts of North Africa, like Tuni the, the tip of Tunisia. Um, and they ruled northern Italy as well. So not a situation that the papacy, as you'll see, was very hap uh, happy about. And here is, we're now in the 16th century, the time of the High Renaissance, just showing Italy will return to this. So the papal state or the church states has this interesting um, form. Um, and we'll see the origins of it shortly. Um, Urbino is usually a part of the papal state. There's Tuscany and here's our Venetian Republic um, as in its largest extent as it moved into the mainland in the 16th uh, century. Okay, so the theme. Empire is one of the themes. Now, because at a certain point in the fourth century through the fifth, um, the Roman Empire became a Christian empire it was also, the theme became two empires, the empire of this world and the empire of the church, both church militant, which is to say in this world, and church triumphant, transcendent. And this is a great painting by an English painter, Frank Dixie, painted around 1900, entitled The Two Crowns. Of course, the royal crown the crown of thorns, everybody is zeroed in on this guy. He's suddenly brought face to face with the other crown. Now, this is a processional cross in the cathedral at Aachen today. It's known as the Cross of Lothair. Um, it's about a thousand years old, probably created um, in the year 1000 or thereabouts. And it has an interesting, it's known as the Cross of Lothair because of this um, rather miserable Carolingian cameo that once belonged to uh, one of the successors to Charlemagne, Lothair. Um, but it was probably created for the Holy Roman Emperor um, Otto III, who reigned around the year 1000. And it includes a wonderful cameo of Caesar Augustus. So, the theme of empire. And of the other empire, on the other side of the cross, of course, the crucified Christ in this wonderful um, 
incised image. Um, the best version of it, unfortunately, that I could find online is this black and white image. So, the two worlds, and Venice very much is the drama of Venice is caught. In the drama of these two worlds, uh, the form of the processional cross goes back to the fifth century. This is a mosaic from Ravenna. And Venice exists because Ravenna pre-existed it. As we'll see, this is the great church of St. Uh, Apollinaria in Classe. Classe means the port of Ravenna. So, as I said, the history, the history of Venice begins with Rome. And um, the history of Western Christianity also begins with what happened in Rome in the late um, first century BC and first century AD. So just to give you a bit, of, a bit more of geography, Italy is a part of Europe, which is a part of the Eurasian continental landmass. Um, Italy exists south of the Alps. There's our city of Venice. How many of you have actually been to Venice? Oh, that's good. How many of you have been to Venice on a clear day? So you know that you can see the Alps on a clear day. The Alps preside over the city. Unfortunately, because of that uh, industrial city due west of Venice, clear days are few and far between. But um, it's uh, spectacular how visible they are. So, as I said, a Roman city. This is just a hint of the history of Rome. Now, like Rome, Venice is a city that becomes an empire. Rome is in many ways the most improbable of empires. This is a map which shows the expansion of the Roman polity from around 500 to around 200 BC. And um, this is a fabulous painting by Angre, his basically graduation painting as a student at the uh, French Academy in Rome. It's a huge painting. Um, and uh, it represents the mythical founding of Rome. The figure in the center, of course, is Romulus. Rome, from its beginnings, was a city perpetually at war. Um, and um, its dominance in the uh, Mediterranean comes from it ultimately defeating all its competitors in the uh, Mediterranean, but most um, immediately um, during the so-called Punic Wars, its only serious competitor which was Carthage. Um, Carthage for a while also dominated Sicily and Sardinia and much of Spain. And this is a painting by Tiepolo that represents the Roman triumph over Carthage, although the painting, the subject of the painting isn't that. The subject of the painting is the clemency of Scipio Africanus. Scipio was named Africanus because he conquered Carthage defeated Hannibal in the Second Punic War, which pretty much ended any hope for Carthage's uh, dominance in the Mediterranean. The Third Punic War was just a mopping up operation, although a pretty bloody one. This painting you can see with your own eyes in Baltimore. It's a huge painting. It's as wide as this room and twice as tall. So it's a spectacular painting. So, the empire out of which um, Venice emerges was not immediate. This shows uh, the yellow are the territories directly used, ruled by Rome around uh, 58 BC at the beginning of Julius Caesar's career. Um, they were at this point the strongest power in the Mediterranean, but nowhere as near. Of course, the agent of change, the principal agents, agent of change uh, in the end was Julius Caesar, both directly and through his great nephew um, who became Augustus. 
This is a fabulous painting um, by Lionel Royer um, of uh, Lionel Royer. I, I don't know, he's a French painter, so I should try to um, pronounce it in a French manner. Of Julius Caesar receiving the surrender of his uh, most formidable Gallic adversary, Vercingetrix. Um, who ended up miserably, um, but I won't go into details. So um, at the beginning of the final civil war between Augustus and uh, Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, this was the territory directly ruled by Rome and its lieutenants. Julius Caesar, of course, added Gaul, as you can see. But it was actually a gust, okay, so this painting by Alma Tatema represents that final civil war, a fabulous painting, uh, iconic of the meeting of Augustus's great adversary with um, Cleopatra. And then finally, the green are all the territories that were added by Augustus to the Roman Empire and also the pink were the territories which Augustus made into tributary states of the Roman Empire. So literally the Roman Empire really does begin with Augustus. The Roman Empire that covered the territory that it would hold on to for much of the next 400 years. And this is a wonderful painting by, again, Amitadema of um, Caesar Augustus, um, represented uh, by his uh, great statue, the so-called Prima Parta statue. So, it was a ruthless military empire. These are the legions that um, Augustus controlled, and they are uh, placed in those parts of the empire, which would be for the next 400 years plus, in a state of perpetual war. So it was an empire that was always at war. And as long as they were good at war, they were doing well. And this is a fabulous painting, which I've also shown you by uh, Jerome, Jean-Léon Jerome, called The Age of Augustus and the Birth of Christ. It's another iconic image of the two realms. Um, of course, pretty much everybody is focused on Augustus as a divinity up here. And in the foreground is this other event which will transform the Mediterranean and the world. Okay, so this is a map of the Roman Empire it's at its fullest extent, including most of the Pannonian Plain and uh, today's Romania then known as Dacia. And also at times the Euphrates, uh, Tigris Euphrates Valley and uh, today's Armenia and Azerbaijan and uh, Eastern Iran. And here is a lovely painting by Delacroix who is very much a painter of the late uh, Venetian manner. Um, his hero is you probably know, um, was the, uh, another um, painter uh, inspired by Venice, uh, Rubens. And uh, this represents the justice of Trajan. Um, it comes from an ancient anecdote, which has been associated both with Trajan and also with uh, Hadrian, his successor. And the anecdote is essentially that uh, um, the, the Roman rulers were primarily reactive, which is to say they didn't initiate policies in reacting to circumstances they created precedent. So very much the same dynamic which gave us English common law. And here you see um, a woman coming up to the ruler and asking for him to make a judgment in a case that involves her. And he essentially tells her um, that he's a little busy going off to war. And her comment, and this is also said in the anecdote more explicitly pertaining to Hadrian, 
Her comment was simply, oh, you're too busy to be emperor? Because the primary purpose of the emperor was to listen and to, in that Solomonic, the way of the Solomonic story, render justice. So that's why this is called The Justice of Trajan, a fabulous painting. Now, Rome was a part of a much bigger world. Because the remains are so miserable, um, just a fraction of a, you know, 0.001% of what was once the Roman world, we tend to forget that Rome was very aware of the two other great civilizations on the Eurasian continent, China and India, and Rome traded both directly and indirectly with China through the Silk Road, which is the northern road, which then went to India and then through the Red Sea into the um, Mediterranean. And, and through the um, Red Sea, it also traded directly both with eastern and western, western and eastern India as well. And India itself, Indian civilization, in effect, artistically, begins with Alexander the Great. Um, before that, they were just living in grass huts. Um, Alexander brought them monumental sculpture through his successors and monumental architecture. And in fact, um, if you take an art history class that deals with the origins of ancient Indian and Chinese sculpture, you will learn that the origins of ancient Indian and Chinese drapery is in fact Greek Hellenistic drapery. So this was a much more interconnected world than we're familiar with. Um, and until the fourth century, primarily a pagan world. So this painting by Alma Tadema, I'm trying to use as many Alma Tadema paintings for this class as I can, because I'm gonna have to give them up for the rest of this course. Um, represents the pagan world. Um, it's simply called In the Temple. It shows a temple acolyte, um, a altar, a bronze altar. Here you have a large marble altar. And um, just a fantastic scene, but that's another story. Okay, so by around 300 AD, the Roman Empire was reaching its internal crisis with Diocletian and Galerius instituting the final great persecution. And out of that crucible emerges the first uh, Christian ruler of the Roman Empire, Constantine. This is a contemporary statue. Um, you can see it right next to York Minster in the city of York. Um, and um, it was uh, commissioned in 1998. And I think it's actually a surprisingly fine statue. I find most contemporary statues incompetent at best. So this is certainly more than competent. And um, another great um, 19th, early 20th century painter, a Polish painter, though educated in Russia, Painting, um, what, a painting called The Future Victims of the Colosseum, um, showing the preaching of Peter um, in the first century. There's the Colosseum. It's a little uh, anachronistic because, well, maybe not. Well, yeah, of course it is, because the Colosseum postdates the persecution of Nero. So, but it's iconic of that. Okay. The second crisis of, of empire in the Roman world is the disillusion of the political unity of the Mediterranean. And um, so we'll, and this is the beginning of Venetian history. Child emperors are bad news. And um, this is a beautiful painting by a great um, late uh, Ecole de Beaux-Arts French painter, Jean-Paul Lorenz, uh, painted around 1880, of the Roman Emperor Honorius, who succeeded his father um, Theodosius I, otherwise known as Theodosius the Great, who's the last ruler of a unified uh, Mediterranean Roman rule. Um, 
weighted down by the um, icons of rule, um, not exactly fitting in his throne. And uh, these are, this represents the provinces of the Roman Empire um, when uh, Honorius succeeds as the Western Emperor and his older brother Arcadius, the Eastern Emperor. And this is a fantastic painting by John William Waterhouse that represents the moment when Honorius is, receives the news in 410 AD that the city of Rome has been captured by Alaric and his Goths. Now, this is a mythological story. It's not historically true, but it is said that Honorius was busy with his favorite birds, pigeons and chickens, feeding them when the news came to him. And here you have the, the rather anxious, unhappy courtiers bringing the bad news. They look more like they're backing out rather than coming forward. It's a brilliant painting. And um, so they, told, told, they tell him that they're having, you know, they have to give him really bad news about Rome. Now, the anecdote is that his favorite chicken was called Rome. And so he was supposed to have said, well, what's happened to my favorite chicken? No, no, sire. The city has fallen to the Goths. Okay. So I think you'll agree that's a fantastic painting. This is a more conventional painting of the fall of Rome to the Goths in 410. Um, by another French painter, Sylvester, um, painted um, around 1890. It's again emblematic. Um, they did not run around um, like uh, escape models from your studio, your life drawing studio. Um, nor were they pulling down imperial statues. In fact, the Goths desperately wanted to become Romans. They just didn't know how, or the w their way of going about it was also problematic. Okay, the fall of Rome led directly to one of the great works of um, Catholic Christian theology and literature um, uh, written by um, one of the great fathers of the church, uh, St. Augustine, of course, and... Um, the name of the book is The City of God. This is a Flemish painting um, from the 17th century representing St. Augustine. And I like this painting because it's a very contemplative St. Augustine. Though he's very much in a 17th century getup. He certainly would not have looked like that. He was a good Roman. He would have worn a 4th century AD Roman garb. Okay. The problem with empires. One of the problems with empires is the prosperity of the center draws less prosperous people to itself, and those people want to become participants in the prosperity of the center. Um, however, they bring with them habits which are not exactly conducive to maintaining that prosperity. So, um, the pressure on the frontiers was there from the beginning. It was the fact that the center became hollowed out that ultimately created the vacuum that pulled in the, um, the tribes that ultimately brought about the collapse of the western half of the empire. And actually, the fatal day was actually before 410. It was um, the last day of the year. 405, when uh, the Rhine frontier was breached for the final time, and a huge um, group of um, allied tribes, including Vandals, Goths, um, Alani, who were actually not German, Suevi, who were German, crossed into and um, rampaged through Gaul and ultimately breached the frontier um, into Spain and largely settled in Spain before a part of them went even further. So this is more iconic of that 
disaster. You have basically whole nations moving with all their goods. Um, you should imagine this looking more like um, 20th century movies of the settlement of the West with those wagon trains and etc. Except that you know they, there's no refrigeration, no freeze-dried food. You have to live off the land. The problem is somebody else is already living off the land. You take away their food, they die. So um, the disruption was huge and ultimately destroyed the tax base of the Western rulers who ruled from originally uh, Milan and ultimately Ravenna. So it didn't have to happen. The East survived the trauma of the fifth century, but the West did not. And it had a lot to do with the disastrous child rulers which were placed on the throne, which means that you, if you have a weak ruler, you have competition around who's going to influence them, which means you have a kind of perpetual civil war at the top. And of course, that pulls in the people who are rampaging through the empire, some of which will take one side, some of which will take the other, and then you ultimately have collapse. So, um, we're now, uh, this, this image represents collapse. Okay, I'll zoom ahead. The beginning of the story of Venice begins with Attila the Hun. Now, this is the story of Venice, this is not the history of Venice. However, because the Venetians were never a Roman city, it was just an island with huts during Roman times, or actually a bunch of small marshy islands with huts, um, they had to connect their history to something important that happened. So as you'll see, the, the, the actual historical beginnings are not this, but when you're there and you listen to the tour guides, it will say that it was Attila's invasion of Italy in um, five, sorry, 452 that gave rise to Venice. Now the Huns at this point controlled uh, Central Eastern Europe and were constantly um, both um, extorting gold from the Eastern Roman emperors ruling from Constantinople or occasionally plundering expeditions into the Balkans until they uh, basically got that um, lucrative uh, business ran dry and then, they, and then they drew their attention to the West. So the great event of uh, 452 was the incursion into Italy. And this is Raphael's great painting, which represents the stopping of the Huns in Northern Italy by uh, Pope Leo uh, III. And um, so you see um, Pope Leo has friends on his side, St. Peter and Paul. Um, here are the Huns recoiling, probably at that. Um, well, we don't really know what happened. We know that Leo went up north and met with Attila the Hun, and then Attila withdrew. And then the following year, as he was preparing to reinvade Italy, he died after a big wedding feast, um, where he was the, the groom. So um, it's still a fantastic painting. But before this meeting, he destroyed one of the great cities of the northern um, Adriatic. He destroyed um, the city of Aquileia, um, which was an imperial city, which meant that it was also one of the cities which had a palace and was the residence of the emperors as they moved um, across the northern frontiers, doing their best to uh, maintain the integrity of the borders. Um, here's a plan of it. He utterly destroyed it. Nothing was left. 
Um, it's an archaeological site today. And when you visit uh, Aquileia, there's a wonderful large uh, model reconstructing the city as it looked like when until the Hun um, killed all its inhabitants and torched the city. Now, it is said that out of the ruins of the city, refugees moved into the lagoon and settled the islands, and therefore this is the beginning of Venetian history. This is simply not true. Um, Aquile Aqu okay. Aquileia was the center of a, a bishopric, and it was the bishop of Aquileia who moved south to the city of Grado, and um, eventually the Venetians acquired that bishopric, but that's another story. So, as I was saying earlier, the Eastern, and sorry, the Western Empire did not have to collapse. The Eastern Empire survived this crisis. The degree to which it didn't have to collapse is represented by this image. We're now in the last 20 years of the Western Empire. Um, the very energetic Emperor Maiorian managed to reconquer most of Spain and was well on his way to reconquering Gaul when he was murdered by his principal general. And so the, uh, the, the nature of the Western court was that the competi competing aristocratic and other factions relied on their influence by having a weak emperor. The problem is the weak emperor is also the principal agent of military, the projection of military force. So if you don't have a strong emperor, you can't project military force that way. And ultimately, when they lost their tax base in Spain, uh, Gaul, and North Africa, they became too poor to even have a, a reasonable barbarian mercenary army, and so the last mercenaries rebelled, and that was the end of the Western Empire, and into that vacuum moved the Goths and took over the so-called Ostrogoths, the Eastern Goths, and took over the whole of Italy, but Italy was largely intact at that point. It had, it had suffered wear and tear, and this uh, late Roman world in its in its coherence and also incipient demise is brilliantly portrayed by this fabulous painting of Amatatimus called The Education of the Children of Clovis. And it has everything to do with, these are all barbarians. Well, actually there are a few Romans here as well, but so you have wannabe Romans. These guys are wannabe Romans too, but they're also Gauls. And the new education is being, sorry, the new generation is being educated as good Gauls, which is to say their principal business is even more fratricidal warfare than the Romans engaged in, which has a way of wearing down a society to the point where most of the benefits of civilization are eventually lost. So, it's all there for the most part. Gaul, the reason why when you go to France, you listen to a uh, evolved version of um, late um, Latin um, is because they never stopped being Romans. However, things did change. So, we're finally getting to the to the denouement of our story, and next week we'll take it f from beyond the uh, the establishment of the refuge that is the origin of Venice. So, there was a Roman revival in the sixth century. Um, the revival was led by a very energetic um, Eastern ruler. This is the iconic representation of him in the Church of San Vitale in um, Ravenna, Justinian. Um, here you see him with his representative court. He reconquered North Africa. He evicted the, at that point, decadent Vandal Kingdom of North Africa. He began the reconquest of Southern Spain. 
But the bloodiest and ultimately most catastrophic reconquest was the reconquest of Italy. And it's very simple. Um, but before we get to there, we'll look at some of his great achievements. His greatest architectural achievement is still visitable, a very Roman building, albeit with some exotic ornament, the uh, Church of the Holy Wisdom, the Hagia Sophia in today's Istanbul, Constantinople, as it was until the 1920s. And here is a digital reconstruction of the center with the ambo and the enclosed altar. Um, it's okay, it's not great. Here's a much better um, sectional elevation of the ambo and the altar and the ciborium and some of the mosaics that were placed there in the 8th century, 8th and ninth century. Okay, Constantinople. After the collapse of the West, um, Constantinople ultimately probably had a population of three quarters of a million people and was the great city of the Mediterranean for about a thousand years. So, i.e., it was important. And what was Venice? Venice was, in fact, an outpost of Constantinople. So there's the center from a, a bird's eye view of the area of the palace and the Hippodrome. The Hagia Sophia is right here. Here we have the inner harbor called the Golden Horn, called Golden because of all the wealth that arrived there through trade. Um, here is the Imperial Harbor in the foreground. The Forum of Constantine with a huge porphyry column with the golden statue of Constantine. See, rather Roman looking. This is the Senate House, the new Senate House, uh, post-Justinian. Here is the atrium of another palace, and this is actually archeologically pretty good. Um, a gigantic rotunda, about three quarters of the size of the Pantheon in Rome, that um, we know sadly very little about. It could have been another imperial palace. Here's a digital bird's eye view of the city at its height, around the year 1000. So it, was, it survived. It had something Rome didn't have. It was on the sea, directly on the sea. So if it was besieged by land, the besiegers were stopped by the greatest um, city walls of uh, European history, the great land walls of Theodosius II. And it could be supplied from its um, eastern provinces by sea. So any extended siege was not likely to succeed. It had a very good navy, and it had something which um, is known colloquially, uh, colloquially as Greek fire. Um, it had uh, flamethrowers on their ships, which um, pretty much destroyed any ships that tried to besiege it by sea. So here is a perspective of the great land walls. It was a triple wall with a moat. Um, when the Goths arrived the first time, they shrugged their shoulders and then walked away. And the famous saying is, we do not fight with walls. <laughs> so substantial walls uh, preserved the city and kept it going until um, the 15th century. Um, what destroyed these walls were um, Western cannon which were sold to the Ottoman Turks. And here is the view of the walls from the perspective of the besiegers. So a triple wall was a formidable wall. And as I said, it kept, out, kept people out for more than a thousand years. Very good late Roman opus cementicum construction. Okay, so what happened? Reconquering, city, reconquering Italy was disastrous because Justinian simply did not have the resources to easily defeat the, the Ostrogoths, the Eastern Goths. And so what, what ensued was a war that lasted for 20 years, 
a war that went back and forth, back and forth. Rome was besieged twice. It was starved. It went from a city of about 250,000 to a city of about 5,000. Um, various of the cities, Milan was torched, um, Naples was torched. It was this war that destroyed classical Italy. Um, this represents the early triumphant part of the war uh, when Count Belisarius, um, Justinian's brilliant general, managed to defeat the Gauls, sorry, the Goths, but not decisively. And then this map represents the continuation of that war. And a later general, Narses, came through the Balkans, ultimately defeated the Goths, destroyed the Goths, and of course, the other disaster was the first great plague, which killed off more than half the population of the Mediterranean. So between the wars and the plague, what it meant that the people who were not affected by the plague, i.e. the people in the north, in this case the Lombards, simply walked into Italy. And um, this represents the, their journey over a few centuries. Um, from, De from southern Denmark into northern Italy. And so when, you're, when you visit Italy and see blue-eyed, blonde-eyed people, their ancestors are both Goths and Lombards. That's why you have Lombardy. So the red represents the kingdom of the Lombards. They did not take over the whole of Italy. The, the, the toe and the heel of Italy remained under Roman control. The area around Ravenna remained out, under Roman control. The area around Rome remained under Roman control. But the rest of Italy was overrun. So um, the Ro area of Roman control was called the Exarchate of Italy, and it was ruled not from Rome, but from Ravenna which was then a lot like Venice. It was in the center of a marsh surrounded by lagoons, and therefore it was not easy to besiege. And it was the center of the, uh, the Roman navy of the Aegean, so they were able to hold on to large stretches. Eventually, the, the Lombardic kingdom devolved into a series of duchies with only the more northern one retaining the name of kingdom. And this is what the most northern terrain controlled like by Rome looked like. So there's our lagoon. There's the future Venice. There's Aquileia, what's left of it. Um, there's Grado. So the refugees from Aquileia moved to Grado, which was at the end of a peninsula. It was the invasion of the Lombards that created the disruption that ultimately um, this whole area of the lagoon filled up with refugee settlements. But who were the Lombards? It's not a glorious history. It doesn't have the cachet of Attila, the Huns, the great battles, you know, the, the meeting with the Pope and all that. So the real history was then covered over by the mythical history, which uh, projected the foundation of Venice about um, 150 years earlier. So the Romans were still a going concern. They held on to large sections of Italy. At this point, they still held on to North Africa. Here's another image of uh, the Roman world in the Mediterranean in the year 600, and I'll, I'll wrap up here. Something else was happening in the first decades of the seventh century. So the last great war of the Romans and the Persians, a catastrophic war, and a lot like the war to reconquer Italy, it led to um, it ultimately led to the Persians almost conquering the Eastern Roman Empire and the, the, um, the battle to expel them from Anatolia ultimately wore down both the Persians and the Romans. And there was a new people that emerged out of, a, at that point, ignored part of the world. 
Arabia, and you have a new religion which was fermenting at the same time. And in a matter of decades, this new religion, which we now know as Islam, um, took over the whole of the Persian Empire and ultimately took over all of Roman North Africa and all of Spain. So this is um, the Mediterranean around 750 AD. And there's a new imperial player on the stage and a desperately rear guard fighting remnant of the Roman Empire in Asia Minor. And of course, there'll be another new player up here. So, in the meantime, Venice is a distant outpost of the Roman Empire. And this is a story of the periphery and the center and the competition between the periphery and the center. So, eventually, <laughs> The Romans were worn down to just the area around uh, Rome, Sicily, just the southern part of the boot of Italy and the bottom of the heel, and Sardinia. And we're now in the 750s. And the papacy, which was dependent on Constantinople, realized that it may not survive the Lombards. The problem with the Lombards was they weren't Catholic. They were a splinter group of Christianity, a heretical anti-Trinitarian um, version called Arianism based on the presbyter from, um, the, the priest from Alexandria, who in the early fourth century developed the idea that God the Father was God and there was a second God, God the Son, so definitely not very Trinitarian. And this was easier for the Germans to get their heads around than the doctrine of the Trinities, which is why the Goths started out as Arians. Anyhow, so what happened? They sent an embassy out west to the new player in town. So the Romans are the red. And it's the emerging kingdom of uh, the Franks and its first non-Merovingian ruler, the first Carolingian, Pippin. And Pippin said, okay, um, if you make me king, I'll help you. And so Pippin saved the popes by invading northern Italy and putting an end to the kingdom of the Lombards. And so the remnants, and we're going to stop here. And so the remnants, to be continued next week, so the remnants of the Roman portions that used to control central Italy then became the, what was later the papal state. But they had a new overlord with greater ability to project more efficient and greater military force to defend them from the local troublemakers um, because it wasn't just the Lombards that were the problem. Um, as you'll see, Rome was invaded from North Africa, and they eventually captured the bot bot bottom of Sicily as well. Sorry, Sicily and the bottom of Italy. So we will continue next week. So that's the first thousand years.